Good morning. My name is David Plotz. I'm the editor of Slate. And I'm very glad to welcome all of you to what will be a really interesting day of discussions about geoengineering. Uh, geoengineering, the horrifying idea whose time has come, question mark. Um, this is part of a collaboration among Slate, the New America Foundation, and Arizona State University, a collaboration called Future Tense, which is a, an ongoing series of events about, excuse me, about uh, very, very large problems, very, very large problems that are either here today or right around the corner, and how technology can or cannot address those problems, or maybe technology will worsen those problems, as we, we could discuss today. And today's topic of geoengineering is a perfect discussion for this, because it is obviously wrapped up in climate change uh, and is wrapped up in huge questions about whether states can act in this realm, whether individuals might act, whether the technology is even possible, whether the technology will backfire on us all discussions uh, we're going to have in the course of today. But first, we're going to start by um, talking to one of the, the few people in Washington, and perhaps the only person in Washington politics who has addressed this uh, question head on, and that's Congressman Bart Gordon. Congressman Gordon is a 13 term, 13 term, is that right? Right. 13 term Democrat from Tennessee. He's the chair of the House Science and Technology Committee. And in that capacity, he has held a series of hearings about geoengineering and has, I think he has a, a study that is about to come out from his committee about geoengineering. And he is uh, really the, he is, as I said, the, the, the one person in Washington who has looked at this issue and thought this is fascinating and important and we have to investigate it. Um, unfortunately, he will be retiring after this term. So perhaps one thing he'll leave us with is a sense about who is going to carry on uh, this research and these, this kind of uh, this this uh, process from the political end after he leaves us. So, Congressman Gordon, if you we can sit and talk, okay. or you, yeah, if you'd like to. Yeah, we'll just sit. Let me. Is this is this on? Okay, good. Well, thank you, David, for that kind introduction. Um, um, I mentioned this the other day. It's it's a better introduction than I received from my senior senator from Tennessee, Lamar Alexander, a while back. Um, Lamar and I had been working together on a project, and he asked me to come over to the Senate and bring some of the senators up to speed on it. And when he introduced me, he said, this is my friend Bart Gordon. He's dean of our Tennessee congressional delegation. But then he quickly added, dean doesn't mean he's the smartest, just means he's been here the longest. <laughs> so 26 years has gone uh, very uh, quickly. Uh, and when it comes to geoengineering, I I'm certainly not the smartest one here. I, I, I see some folks that have testified before us or that I have met on other occasions. So I'm glad that they're here. Uh, I, I was advised that there are all ranges of levels of, for lack of a better term, knowledge about geoengineering, or probably, as Marty Apple tells me, it would be better to be s s defined as climate engineering. So just real quickly, climate engineering is, is the large-scale altering of uh, the atmosphere, either to take uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or to uh, uh, have some type of a, of a uh, shield or whatever that would reverse, that would send radiation uh, back into, um, away from the earth. So you'll get a better definition later, but that just gives you a, a quick overview. Uh, the, and you, you mentioned about how how much I'd been involved in this. Uh, it was a reporter asked me the other day about this and some other things. And, and when she was doing that, she asked me uh, what was my area of science specialty. Um, and I told her political science. And uh, <laughs> my objective is to try to take the good ideas that I find and then try to implement those. And uh, in this case, a lot of those good ideas came from my staff. And Jane and Ann, stick up your hand there. They're both on the, uh, the uh, subcommittee uh, that deals with that. And so if you have other questions later or thoughts, you might want to talk with Jane um, or, or, or Ann. Now, you know, what I thought I might do is just give you sort of a, uh, a timeline on what I've been involved in at least anyway, and then w tell you where I think that we should be going. This was a subject that really um, people were afraid to talk about uh, not too long ago. And uh, we felt 
that there should be uh, some conversation and that um, uh, let's get it out on the table. And uh, we're seeing three books that are just recently come out, a variety of reports. And I, I'm, I'll just sort of for a bibliography so you can learn more about that, I'm going to tell you about some of those reports and also tell you that um, uh, I think it's very important that we're transparent in all the discussions <coughs> uh, and with the information that is provided on climate engineering. Uh, and you can find a lot of that on our website, uh, science.house.gov, and you can also replay some of our hearings and things of that nature. Well, to some extent, it, this started back in April of 2009. Phil Willis, who is the chairman of the Science uh, and Technology Committee in the UK Parliament, came to see me with some of his members. And during the discussion, uh, we decided that it would be beneficial for a variety of reasons uh, for us to have dual hearings dual and a single report uh, uh, from the UK Parliament uh, and from the United States Congress. Uh, it was a little bit after that that the uh, UK Royal Society released its uh, comprehensive report, Geoengineering, the Climate, uh, Science, Governance, and Uncertainty, which really was, I think, the definitive work uh, at that time. It's being built upon now. And so we decided that we would uh, move forward uh, in that regard uh, and have, have a joint hearings uh, on geoengineering. Uh, here in the United States, we would look at more of the research uh, aspect of it, uh, and the UK Parliament would be looking more at the governance aspect. Uh, because whatever happens with geoengineering is going to have multinational uh, impacts, and so there needs to be some type of governance there. And we also need to keep in mind that many of the areas of geoengineering or climate engineering are not all that expensive. So a, you know, a well-intentioned do-gooder, uh, and there are a lot of those billionaires around right now, you wouldn't even have to be a billionaire. You could just be a bunch of millionaire, and you could still start uh, implementing some of this that could have uh, really grave uh, impact in other, other countries. Mm -hmm. So um, on November the 5th, uh, we had our first uh, hearing entitled Geoengineering, Assessing the Implications of Large-Scale Climate Intervention. David Keith, uh, who will, will be up to bat, I think, next, uh, was, uh, at, was, at, was our sort of kickoff um, speaker at that hearing. Then on February the 4th, we had a second hearing, Geoengineering 2, uh, the Scientific Basis and Engineering Challenges. And then the third hearing was in March of this year um, with Domestic and International Research Governance uh, and Chairman uh, Willis uh, from the UK Parliament uh, also testified uh, at that hearing. Um, in Mar also, uh, and then on, it was also on that same date, March 18th, that they came out with their uh, report uh, on, on governance. Um, also in March of this year, the UK Royal Society, uh, partnering, uh, and its partners, which are the Environmental Defense Fund and the Academy of Science for Developing Worlds, uh, initiated a solar radiation management governance initiative to explore appropriate governance uh, of any parts of what they call SRM geoengineering. And uh, I think that was a, a good breakthrough uh, that the uh, Environmental Defense Fund is joining them. And I think you're going to see uh, more of that activity too. And then May of this year, the National Research Council released uh, uh, its Congressional Requested America's Climate Choices and for the first time included some of the carbon dioxide remo removal geoengineering uh, strategies. Uh, in July of this year, I went to Brussels to meet with the uh, uh, UK, or rather the um, uh, EU Parliament, which, as many of you know, since the recent Lisbon Treaty has taken on a great deal of new authority. And um, I, I, I testified before a committee with similar jurisdiction of ours, the, the Science Technology Committee, within the UK uh, Parliament, told them what we had done uh, at the UK and that we would be getting them a report soon, which will be later this next month, and uh, suggested uh, that they may want to review that, uh, a minute, make some corrections, or not corrections, but, uh, but additions. Uh, really, the effort is to broaden, you know, the universe of countries that are looking at this to get us, you know, more on the same page. So I think you'll probably be seeing something uh, from that. Then on August the 16th of this year, the uh, CRS, Congressional Research Service, released a report, Geoengineering Governance and Technology Policy, which it was a follow-up from a request that we had made to them. Now, as we come into October, uh, the action 
just gets more aggressive, and the GO has another report, um, again, uh, that, that will be coming out. Um, and, and then our committee has a report that will be coming out. The GAO, the GAO report will discuss ongoing research activities in the federal agencies that relate to geoengineering, and our report will explore existing capacities, not activities, but existing capacities in agencies. The potential organization structures for managing research and key ideas to keep in mind as the discipline uh, develops. And then finally, in December of this year, uh, GEO will release its companion piece to the October report, which is technology assessment of various geoengineering strategies in the style of the now defunct OTA. Um, so uh, you can see there's a lot of activities. There was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, about three books that were co came out this year and a variety of different organizations are putting together <coughs> different types of task force. But when you look at all these various reports, there's a common denominator. And, the com and also, I think there's a, a bottom line, too. But the common denominator is that there are uh, powerful, potentially uh, destructive um, uh, uh, byproducts and potentially unintended consequences to any type of effort for geoengineering. Uh, the other common denominator is <clears throat> that there may be a point, a tipping point, where the result of climate change would be even worse uh, than that. And so clearly uh, we need to have a path forward. Uh, we do not want to get to that tipping point and not have a lot of information uh, that um, uh, will help us in, at, at that point. And so there, we do need to move forward and we need to move forward on an international uh, uh, way and we need to move forward with complete transparency. Uh, again, there's going to be a lot of, of skepticism to geoengineering. And so we need to be sure that we have that transparency. Now, in terms of the U.S. and what we should be, be doing, uh, right now there are a, um, there are like a lot of static here. Are we going to go on? There we go. Okay. Um, you have a cell phone on that's probably doing it. Well, I had it on mute, but we'll put it back here. Um, so. You find right now within various federal agencies, NASA, NOAA, uh, geological uh, surveys uh, within the Department of Energy, at the off, uh, in particular the Office of Science within the Department of Energy, a lot of what you might call collateral research already going on. It's not really collateral research. It is on point research, but for collateral reasons. Um, carbon capture and sequestration, a lot uh, is going on there. So I think what we need to do right away is try to inventory what is going on uh, in the federal government and in the federal agencies. And then I think we, we need to get to the point of developing a coordinating committee uh, similar to what we did uh, with the National Nanotechnology Initiative. Uh, there was, gosh, I think there was like a billion and a half dollars in, in federal research in nanotechnology spread across. Uh, there was, the research was in, I think, 12 different agencies, and then there was oversight within an, about another dozen. And so we established a coordinating council there so that we could get a better bang for our, for our buck. And I would suggest that that should be the next step um, in the next Congress is to look at trying to put together that um, uh, coordinating uh, council, uh, as well as setting up a database uh, for all information uh, in term for that area of complete transparency. So with that, David, sort of a background, I'm certainly welcome to any of your thoughts or suggestions, Great. And, and, and as well the audience. Um, thank you for that, that uh, overview, Congressman. Uh, one word I don't think I heard you say was mitigation. Is, do you see the whatever geoengineering attempts at going forward as something that will happen in parallel with mitigation? Is this going to be a substitute for mitigation? It politically, is something, is, is the, the apparent failure of cap and trade and Congress, does that suggest that this has to be, that we move towards geoengineering as a, as a replacement for this? Well, no, certainly not. I think that we need to continue to move forward uh, in every way that we can in terms of reducing uh, those elements that bring about climate change. Um, and there are, uh, I think, some parts of climate engineering, you might say, that uh, very much in parallel. For example, uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, if we come up with some type of a process to take carbon out of the atmosphere, you're, you're going to need the CCS. 
And so I think those things can, can run in parallel. Um, uh, you know, I think that we're already to the point where we have to admit that uh, adaptation uh, at some point is going to have to be, be there. And I think, you know, uh, however you want to define mitigation, I think, unfortunately, we're too far down the, the track and there'll probably be some kind of mitigation. So I would assume that, that uh, climate engineering at different levels uh, will be a part of the future, hopefully not at those uh, really high-risk areas. You know, we've all been to congressional hearings where which someone has called and there's the, the lone person whose issue this is is sitting up there and all the other members are not around. When you do these, do you, it, what's your sense of the interest in this topic among your colleagues? Well, I think at the first hearing, um, we could have altered, we could have changed the t title to voodoo and um, <laughs> people would have thought it was the same thing. I mean, you know, nobody knew what was going on, what, what is all this, so... There wasn't a knowledge level, and quite frankly, it wasn't taken all that seriously. Uh, from some of the, uh, the Republican members, uh, to talk about it was an admission that climate change is real, and they didn't want to do you know, anything like that. So, um, uh, and I remember at, when we finished our third hearing, my ranking member, who is a wonderful fella, looked over at me and said, thank goodness this is over with. Um, so uh, there's not a high level of, um, of understanding or, or interest there, um, in which we didn't expect. You know, my, my really objective was, was, to, was to step forward uh, in somewhat of a void and put this subject out in the public domain for greater discussion. And uh, I think that we've been able uh, to do that, and I think the reports that we have required uh, will provide more of that information. And, I mean, this is a maturing um, subject, and uh, I think you're going to see a lot more discussion, and I think that the ones of you here are going to be, I won't say the cutting edge, but you're going to be really on the first part of what you're going to see, a, a wave of information. Is the, is the, the skepticism you saw and the, the ignorance that you saw among your colleagues, do you think that that's going to forestall any kind of serious funding for it, or do you think that with a, with a few strong advocates in Congress you'll be able to get some funding for research of the sort that you think is going to be necessary? Well, I think that it's going to be hard to get uh, funding for anything new uh, in, in probably this next Congress. And particularly, uh, I think, um, with those that, have, that are skeptical of geoengineering, so, uh, or excuse me, of climate change. But as I mentioned earlier, there is a lot of research that's already going on that, um, uh, that can provide a basis for this. And quite frankly, before we, I think, establish a research program, we do need to capture this information. And I think over the next couple of years, um, again, by coordinating those agencies and the money that's already being spent, uh, we can have a better direction. Also during that period at the time, I think it's important for the um, uh, de State Department to be working through you know, existing uh, really organizations, the UN probably the most likely, uh, to be looking at governance issues. When you look at, going to that governance question, when you look at uh, what you saw among your British colleagues and the, the EU colleagues, how does their, where, where is their thinking compared to, to where Americans are with this? Are they going down a different track? Is it the same sort of questions, but they're further along? Is it, are they at the same position? Are we likely to see sort of more extensive initiatives coming out of Europe in the next coming, in the next few years? Well, there's, there's a much higher level of sensitivity to climate change uh, in the EU. Whether you run um, as a conservative, a liberal, or labor party, whatever you run on, your constituents um, are concerned about climate change. And so virtually across party lines, they're concerned about climate change. And so because of that, I think there is a greater sensitivity uh, to something like uh, climate or geoengineering. Um, and I think the, the Royal Academy was sort of the, to me, was one of the breakthrough organizations in terms of the reports that they have done. Uh, but once again, this is a period of time where uh, it's going to be hard to, um, to bring new money to bear. But there's, there's a lot of money already committed to CCS uh, and, and other areas that, again, I think that if we, that if we double track it, uh, that we can um, again get our arms around this, and then there'll be, I think, 
more money and more programs in the, in the near future. Okay, one more question for me, and then we'll do a, an audience question or two. Uh, so you're you're leaving the Congress. So f first thing, are you going to become one of these Dr. Evil type characters? Is this your next career where you've bought a mountain where you're going to uh, develop the new geoengineering technology? Is that your? Or you not? know, you know, as as I told you earlier, uh, my science is political science, and that is trying to bring these good ideas to the right place. I have a. I'm very interested in uh, real alternative energies and competitiveness of our country and STEM education. This is just one of many things. So I hope to be around in some type of a, you know, public policy um, uh, way that I can help to, to prod uh, this along. But this will just be one of many uh, areas of interest of mine. And in, in all seriousness, it was a setup. Who was going to carry this forward in Congress if you were not there? Because I don't think there's, there's not a much of a bench on this. Well, uh, we've got a great bench on our staff, uh, and that's where the um, really the institutional memory uh, lies. Um, the Science Technology Committee really is the committee that has jurisdiction over the various agencies um, that are the you know the natural uh, for uh, that type of coordination. So I would expect uh, that you'll see uh, a bill put together uh, in the committee. Um, and and hopefully by maybe the second, not the, maybe the first year, but the second year, that there will be a, enough of these outside reports that it will gather information. And again, I think that if we move forward, not asking for additional funds, but rather coordination of spending our funds better that we already have, uh, that we can get that up and going. Let's have a question or two from the audience. Yes, sir. Ide identify yourself, please. What's your sense of uh, what China's doing in this area? Well, I mean, um, I was reading a report the other day where they were suggesting, suggesting that um, uh, cloud seeding in terms of really for rain purposes should not be considered geoengineering. That was one person's, um, uh, you know, suggestion. Um, clearly, the, you know, they're working in that area. Um, they're building, I think it's in it once a week or more than that, a coal-fired plant, and they're, they are doing a lot with carbon capture and sequestration. Um, they've got a real problem over there, and they know it, and um, they are trying. And so I, I don't really know what they're doing now, but I think that they would be a legitimate uh, partner. And hopefully, again, if we had a had a international uh, database, for that transparency that they would play, uh, you know, significant role in it. Yes, ma'am, back there. Uh, just for information, uh, uh, Margaret Line and Climate Response Fund. Just for information on that point, the Chinese National Science Foundation is preparing a research strategy on geoengineering from the Ministry of Science and Technology. There. They are preparing a lot of strategies. Uh, yeah. Oh, we don't, I wasn't trying to downplay that. I mean, I'm just saying I'm sure they are, and it'll be important, and they are doing this in a lot of different ways. Let me also say something, since it hadn't been raised, um, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, I guess, what you might call the environmental standpoint or the environmental movement. Um, you know, it, a few years ago, and I hope that they consider me a part of them, uh, a, a few years ago, um, and I just talk again, generically, uh, the environmental movement did not want to really discuss um, uh, adaptation because that sort of acknowledged that we weren't going to succeed. Well, now I think it's fairly well understood that, you know, climate change is upon us and adaptation, whether it's crops or whatever it might be, are going to be necessary. Um, to a lesser extent, um, nuclear energy was uh, an area that was, you know, not available to discuss. And to a great extent, it's that, that's still the case, but you're seeing um, a, lot, a lot, you know, several environmental standouts that are now uh, recognizing that um, uh, in an appropriate way, and hopefully uh, that, that um, nuclear energy uh, could play a role. And I say that in that um, last week, our committee uh, uh, produced a a bill which uh, hopefully, I don't think we'll get it up next week, but it'll probably have to be in the lame duck session on nuclear energy research, which goes into really a next generation type 
of nuclear energy, which uh, will do with, uh, with proliferation and with storage. And I think, uh, that, yeah, again, the future of nuclear energy is not more of the same, but rather this next generation, which will, I think, be much more environmentally um, sensitive. Congressman, thank you for joining us this morning for kicking this off. I, we all appreciate you coming in, and good luck uh, yeah. with your next career. So I'm going to I'm going to now hand the proceedings over to um, to Jeff Goodell, who's going to be somewhat of, a, of an MC. He's going to introduce our next speaker, who's David Keith. Jeff Goodell's author of How to Cool a Planet, one of the the geoengineering books Congressman Gordon was talking about, and uh, uh, you know knows a ton about this subject and is going to uh, tell us a lot about what he knows today. But first, he's going to introduce David Keith. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I get to introduce David. I'm tempted to tell a story about us, David and I, my trip uh, to the Arctic this summer in our introduction, but I think I'll put that off. Um, and just tell you that David was a very important person uh, to me in my thinking about geoengineering. When I first started looking into this, I thought that um, this was a pretty wild and crazy idea that didn't have much legitimacy. And then I went to see David. And um, I went up to Calgary and um, David struck me as uh, a, a very, um, uh, first of all, he's been thinking about this for a very long time, for 20 or 30 years, been writing about this since he was a, yeah, back at MIT. Um, I think probably longer than almost anyone in this geoengineering world, he's been thinking about the technological and ethical implications of uh, doing this. Um, and he's also a very um, serious-minded person who takes these issues of uh, our relationship with nature uh, quite seriously. Uh, he's a big uh, outdoorsman and um, environmentalist himself. It's also worth noting that his father was very involved in um, the whole fight over um, with DDT and the campaign against DDT and the dangers of DDT. So David understands this whole uh, question of this sort of systemic um, uh, dangers to our environment from industrial life uh, quite well. Um, so, uh, and he runs the, uh, he's the director of the Energy and Environmental Systems Group at the University of Calgary, and he is a um, very fun guy. So, it's David. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I didn't choose the title, and at first, uh, whenever a title is imposed on you, I was rebelling and thinking how much I disliked this title and it didn't correspond to what I wanted to say. The title is, um, I even forget what it is, it's about the endless quest to define geoengineering. But then as I thought about it more, I thought that that is actually a pretty good title for a talk because in fact a lot of the policy debates that I've had, including some recent <laughs> debates with Jane Long in the NSEP uh, policy committee that's one of the probably more important committees operating in DC right now trying to define what to do, are implicitly uh, discussions about what this thing is, defining it. So I'm going to actually circle around exactly that question of how to define it uh, coming to previous definitions of pornography and, and other things. I think you can probably guess which one I'm going to use to, to try and get at why the definition really is at the core of what this thing is and why it bugs us and should bug us. So I'm going to start with a completely boring explanatory slide, which um, which I will do if I can figure out how to pass the slides. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> which says stuff that probably a lot of you know, but I'm assuming maybe not all of you do. So just to start out some really basics, there are two really different classes of technical ideas. I won't even quite say technologies because a lot of these things are purely notional, which go under this broad name geoengineering that have not that much to do with each other. And you don't need to read the details very much, but they've come to be called solar radiation management, things where you alter the amount of sunlight that the Earth absorbs or the amount of infrared light that it radiates. And the temperature and other aspects of climate, the amount of rainfall and so on, are, are a product of those things. Uh, another set of technologies about how we might remove uh, carbon from the air. And these things are almost wholly distinct. Indeed, I think you can make the following statement that the science and technology required to develop, test, and deploy them 
the costs and environmental risks and the challenges they pose for public policy and governance and, and largely ethics too, I think are almost wholly distinct. So that more or less you can treat these as pretty independent things. Um, you certainly, it's in many ways not very useful to think of them in one box and it's, there aren't that many general statements you can make which sensibly apply to both. L let me choose the one on the right, the carbon, removing carbon from the atmosphere ideas and I'm not gonna explain any of these ideas in any detail. Um, um, but I think a key, pretty obvious fact, but it has big implications, is that until emissions, global net emissions of carbon dioxide are zero, uh, 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 removing a ton from the atmosphere is, from the point of view of the climate, exactly the same as not emitting it. No difference. So these technologies vary a lot in terms of their effectiveness, their cost, their environmental risks, and some of them just are, are basically quite ineffective and environmentally risky, like say putting iron into the ocean in most respects. Uh, um, and other ones may or may not be effective. But of course, means that we have to reduce CO2 emissions also vary in their effectiveness, cost, and environmental risk. And all of those things also have environmental risks. So there's some things we do that might seem to reduce emissions that actually don't do very much and have big risk like um, corn-based ethanol and other things that have a big impact that aren't very popular like co-firing biomass and coal-fired power plants, which is quite unsexy but actually quite cost-effective way to reduce emissions. And so in that sense, you could say that the at least until emissions are zero, and I'm going to hazard the wild guess that during my working lifetime emissions won't be zero. So until emissions are zero, these things at some level look like cutting emissions. Not that all ways of cutting emissions are the same and not always removing CO2 from the atmosphere are the same. There are lots of disputes about how you regulate them, who's got jurisdiction, what the risks are. But from the point of view of the climate, they look like the same thing. The stuff on the right, solar radiation management, doesn't look like the same thing. It simply isn't true that, that cooling the planet by putting reflectors in the atmosphere is the same as not emitting. It's just not the same in a pretty fundamental way. You may be able to reduce the risk of climate change by reflecting some sunlight. Indeed, I think there's pretty strong evidence that you can, but they're not the same thing with respect to all that stuff I said before, the science technology, cost and environmental risk, regulation, et cetera. So that I think is pretty fundamental. Um, so I'll come back to these uh, characteristics at the bottom that basically I want to argue that solar radiation management is sort of fast, cheap, and imperfect, and each of those things have policy consequences and and removing carbon is more or less effective and slow and inherently much more expensive with the costs that are kind of similar to the costs of cutting emissions. Um, so let me say a little bit about definitions. Um, I think the two most, uh, I'm trying to construct a general definition here. I'm going to focus most on solar radiation management. I think the two most important keywords to me are scale and intent. So in an article, I think I wrote, more than 10 years ago, I compared gardening and coal-fired electric power. So I think gardening is not coal fired, no, not geoengineering because while the intent is clearly the deliberate manipulation of nature to suit human needs, et cetera, et cetera, it's not global in scale. And I don't think coal-fired electricity generation is geoengineering either. While the effect is global climate change stretching over centuries into the future, that's not why people build coal-fired power plants. They build coal-fired power plants to produce electricity for a bunch of needs and a side effect of doing that, not inconsequential side effect, a side effect a lot of us have spent a lot of our lives trying to restrain, but I think it matters that it's a side effect. If the utilities were trying to put more CO2 in the atmosphere, they would do things differently. Some, some people now say, want to sort of counteract that and say, well, you know, now that we know that climate change is real, burning coal really is geoengineering. And... I mean, you can argue definitions are just how we use words. I don't think that's a very useful way to think about it because I don't think anybody who makes that point is really saying that the way we regulate coal-fired electric power should be the same as the way we regulate putting reflectors in the stratosphere. They're just very different things with different risks. I mean, nobody's proposing cap and trade for solar radiation technologies, at least not yet, I hope. Um, so so I think that that that... In intent matters for lots of reasons uh, uh, that are deep. Um, I mean, I should say, these debates are old. So uh, after Arrhenius first 
showed how putting carbon in the atmosphere could change the climate in the 1890s and produced the first modern calculations that showed how much change we'd get. I know lots of our fellow citizens still don't believe those calculations. Uh, one of his colleagues, Ekholm, actually proposed that we burn coal in mines at the surface to put a lot of carbon in the atmosphere and warm the climate up so that it would be more amenable to, to humans. So these ideas are, are not new on either side. So I think the core of, of uh, of what bugs us about this really cuts to the definition. And I could go on for 10 minutes about what that core is, but I have a cartoon that does it, I think, perfectly, better than anything I could say. So I'm going to read this for those of you who can't read the back. So it's a, it's a great Tolls cartoon. It says, the year 2060, the search for a breakthrough technology to solve climate change continues. Then one of these little geeky scientists says, it's a time machine. We hope it will take us back 50 years when we should have put a price on carbon. <laughs> but now we get closer to the real punchline. Down at, he, Tom tells off and has these two little guys at the bottom. So one of them says, we better hurry. And the other one says, no. That's the great thing about this technology. Right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. And I think that really cuts at the core reason that geoengineering should and does bug a lot of us. This sort of notion that if we have this major thing, this sort of fix that we can pull out quickly later, then there's no rush. There's no reason to hurry. Um, So, so beyond scale and intent, let me go back to two more markers that I think get at it. One is that geoengineering is mostly countervailing. It's not about, it, it's about counteracting something else. So we're balancing a warming with a forced cooling, balancing one thing against another. I think that's key. So scale, intent, and this kind of counteracting or countervailing nature. And then a the last one, which I want to argue really is crucial to the, a bunch of the regulation ethics, and that's leverage. And I'll spend a, a couple minutes talking about that, and then I'm done. So a bunch of these technologies, mostly the SRM ones, but not only them, this is a cross-cutting line, have giant leverage. Leverage in the sense that a little bit of input produces a huge output. Not saying anything, but whether that output or input are good or bad. And so... Yeah, these are some numbers to give you a sense of it. Basically, lifting my mass to the stratosphere once a second, roughly, is enough to uh, alter the global climate. It's a very small amount of material, and because it's a small amount of material, the cost is very low. We've paid an aircraft engineering company to do, you know, spend $100,000 of engineering money trying to figure out the costs, and they've come up with an even lower number than before, so I've revised this slide downwards. That doesn't mean we should do it. It means that cost will not be the core driver of what happens here. And I want to say a little bit more about leverage because I think it's key. Let's forget about climate for a second and think about the difference between the two sorts of things in these bottom boxes. So recombinant DNA, malaria vaccine, nuclear weapons, these are all things where they're really, decisions about them are mostly risk-to-risk -risk decisions. They're not cost-benefit decisions at core. So we don't decide nuclear weapons policy based on the cost of the warheads primarily. And I think SRM is like that. Whereas passenger air transport or clean public water or conventional weapons have altered the world in enormous ways for good or ill, but they're all things that intrinsically cost a fair amount of money. So cost enters into the equation in some way. And I want to argue that, that uh, uh, the things on the right are what I call low leverage and on the left higher leverage, and that a lot of what we think about of geoengineering, the disturbing things, are in this high leverage category, this category where it's so cheap that it doesn't matter very much. So I want to skip over this in just a minute because I'm running a little bit late, but just to say that these key characteristics of the high leverage technologies, which is that they, especially the SRM, that they're fast, that they're cheap, and that they're inherently imperfect, drive the policy in all sorts of interesting ways. The fact that it's inherently imperfect means that this cannot be a substitute for cutting emissions. It can complement it in some ways, but it's not a substitute. The fact that it's cheap and high leverage means the core policy challenges control, and that means in terms of what we need to do in D.C. now, that we should not start a research program that's purely technical. We must, from the beginning, think about how to build the capacity from governance from the beginning. So the last thing I want to say is just to think about some surprises. So this debate is just beginning. Very few people are involved, and it's very hard to tell how it's going to couple to the wider public. And I think uh, a lot of us are overconfident about guessing what's going to happen. And I want to show you a little picture that I took in, from a car in front of me in Calgary that I think uh, uh, tells a story that's useful. Nobody's yet used the word chemtrails, but let me bring it up, and, and everybody will tell you it's totally different. But first of all, for those of you who haven't heard it, there's a group of people who believe the government is spraying uh, poisons from the air to deliberately kill them or change populations or what have you. 
And uh, it's quite a widespread group of people. This comes up, I mean, we're actually now about to, to do a poll, you know, spend $50,000 doing a poll of, of many thousands of Americans and we'll get better statistical data. But it is not, there are a significant number of people who believe this. It comes up again and again uh, when I give public talks. And just to be clear, we even had to call the police because a man at a detail shop reading on the internet the fact that I'm a mass murderer made threatening enough phone calls that we had to call the police. Just gives you a sense of how real this is. And this, this, I was just driving home with my son one day and I saw this car in front of me that has bumper stickers all about me, basically. And just to read them out, it says, University of Calgary gets chem, scientists gets chemtrail funding. And then it says several interesting things. Angels don't play with this harp. Harp is the uh, um, high altitude auroral, it's a microwaves into the aurora experiment that has nothing to do with mind control, but there's a lot of conspiracy theories around it. It says, top scientist advocates mass culling of the human population, 90%. And it says, if there's any man-made climate change, this is actually the most interesting one, uh, it's due to geoengineering. So what's interesting when you talk with these people, and several of us now have been confronted by them actually as protesters uh, outside the AAAS meeting. I talked to 30 of these in a crowd with signs. Um, a lot of them are not, as my preconception was, environmentalists who are mad at us meddling with the planet. They're from the complete other side of the political spectrum. They don't believe in climate change at all. They believe the government is controlling their lives and all the talk about climate change is an excuse for the government to exercise more control over their lives. So nobody's done a very good job of picking apart why people think this way and how many of them do. And obviously, I don't think there's any possibility the government is running such a large-scale, well-organized conspiracy. But um, <laughs> even if it wanted to, I, I just don't think that people keep secrets that well in the real world. But uh, I think that weird attitudes that come out of less left field like that may play around with the way this debate evolves more than you think. I'll end with one positive note. So to me, this is a, a kind of negative thing that came out of left field on this. A positive thing is that if you asked me to guess three or four years ago, I would have guessed that a lot of the mainstream big environmental groups would have had a kind of knee-jerk reaction saying, let's not even talk about geoengineering research because it's just fundamentally wrong to mess with nature. And uh, I'm not saying there's not actually something sensible about that view, but obviously I believe it is worth taking it seriously, not necessarily doing it, because uh, uh, there really are important ways in which could reduce environmental risk. But to my you know, happy surprise, actually most of the big environmental groups have been willing to think pretty hard and thoughtfully and seriously about this, in, in I think just the right way. So that's been a kind of positive outcome. And those of you who heard last night heard David Hawkins' comments on that. So. I think this is the beginning, and it's very hard to predict how this will play out. And thank you very much for listening. Oh, and I guess I forgot the reference to pornography, which obviously is Judge uh, Stevens. No, what was his name? Say, uh, Justice, uh, I got the Justice name wrong, and now I forgot it, saying that I know it when I see it. And I think that really, pardon? Stewart, Stewart not Stevens. I knew it was an S. And I think that sort of is it, that a lot of us do know it when we see it even though we can't define it very well. So now I'm, sorry, I'm introducing Jeff. Is that right now? Pardon? All right, Jeff, why don't you come up and continue your MCing?